So most of you know who I am, why I'm here. I try to do some social media stuff. I decided to put this on here. So if anybody wants to know, I try to get some stuff at times on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram. I don't do them all every day. I don't do them all every week. Sometimes I do two and forget the other four. So you just have to bear with me on that. You get the luck of the draw at times. Whichever one you're a part of, great. If you're not, that's your choice too. There's some different things that I try to post some relevant pieces on as we get through. So I start out, I'm going to start this out by asking this question. How are we scouting fields today? A lot of times we get busy. We just decide we're going to get in the old truck, go take a drive in the afternoon and see how things look. But I want to challenge everybody that driving down the road 55 miles an hour is not going to catch what's going on in some of these fields right now. So we need to be quite proactive and get ourselves out in the field, get your feet on the ground, and uh, go check some things out. This is not a current picture from 2022, but it was taken in uh, western Minnesota a handful of years ago. But we have some winter kill issues in this field. And what happened is we had snow drift over the fence from on, on the south side of the fence line. We got some warm weather. Snow drift started to melt. We refroze. We ponded under some ice. And then we had some winter kill issues and the rest of the field seemed to be okay. But just so you know, those are some of the things that you might see in some different fields across the country at different times. But that was under ice for a while and we had a winter kill scenario. As you drive down the road and you look out across the field, you might see some, some plants that resemble this, where you have a six inch plant to the left. Off to the right, you get something that's, uh, you know, maybe three inches tall. And then a little above that, you get this little guy that's just barely getting out of dormancy, but things are turning green. So as you drive by or you might walk the field, first glance, you think, man, things look pretty good. They're okay. But what we really need to do is get out in that field, maybe take some time, get your stand, your ring out, dig yourself one square foot of material. Well, in this particular example, I took the old plant to the left and the plant to the right, and I dug those, and this is what the stems or the, the crowns look like underneath the grounds. On the right, you're going to see something that resembles a, a typical winter kill view or a look. That goofy yellow color, tan, not bright white material is basically dead crown material. On the left, you have a very healthy crown. It's very woody. If you take your thumbnail and try to penetrate that, it, it's firm, it has good turgid pressure, as they would say. So that's a healthy crown. Now, let's back up two more slides again and say, all right, when we walked that field, we saw a big healthy plant to the left and a crappy one to the right. That is these two exact plants. That was taken the same day, same two plants. So even though you see a green top on that little bitty plant that's kind of behind and not growing well, it's basically dead. You know, we'll get into these scenarios and people might ask, well, let's say, well, Jeff, what do we do to recover from this? The only recovery for the plant on the right is replanted or a new stand started. That's some of those scenarios where there's, there's no recovery. If it's that far along, it's basically dead. So we can't recover from that. This was a photo taken recently in Northwest Iowa, where as you look across the stand, it looks like there might be some weak pieces out there. There's some very good looking vigorous plants. These are five plants represented across the top of the screen on the left that came from this particular field. You see two off to the right that are basically dead. Then you get a couple plants in the middle that might have a little bit of injury to them and you can see, a re you know, there's reduced top growth there. So the regrowth is not, not quite as healthy, but it looks like it's coming okay. And then you have the plant clear off to the left that is, you know, basically a very live, healthy looking type plant. I took, I broke that apart a little bit and I wanted to show you. So again, you get that really off colored yellow. And most of us in the livestock business, if I said it's got that goofy calf crap yellow to it, you'd understand what I'm saying. So as you see this plant, again, there are some green shoots that tried to come out of the top of both of these. So you might look at it and go, well, it looks like it's coming, it's just behind. Well, yeah, it's very much behind. It didn't have enough energy to get out of the ground and keep going, so that plant's basically dead. So again, that yellow is a typical winter kill look. The next slide is the, the two center plants. Now, these have decent looking regrowth to them, but they have some crown damage. You can see they're a little bit off color in the center. 
So these plants are not dead, but they are not full health. They are damaged to some degree. We just don't know quite how bad yet. You can see there's some regrowth actually are showing a little bit of crown damage. So they're behind. As things warm up, you can check today, check again next week. It, next week should really tell us the story. There are probably going to be some plants like this that are going to deteriorate more rapidly and go backwards. We might actually see some tops wilt as the warmer weather accentuates some of the, the damages that we have. So just keep an eye on that. Plant in particular looks to be quite healthy from all the growth that we have on top. It looks like there was a little bit of existing damage to this crown last fall, but it doesn't appear like this plant's going to be dead. Again, as you go start digging plants, because that's going to give us a good clear picture of what's happening. After you see a few of these and you get your hands around them, you'll, you'll get a better idea of what's going on. So this is a picture of a plant that was taken multiple years ago. That was a winter kill situation, actually kind of under a little bit of ice, but I want to show you what these symptoms look like again. So if you look at the center of this crown, you see this dark brown or we'll call it milk chocolate color. That rusty milk chocolate color was a pre-existing damage called crown rot. That's going to be very common in almost all alfalfa plants at some point in time. But this other rusty colored, pukey, calf crap yellow around it that extends down through that tap but is basically the winter kill injury symptom or what we can tell the best of kill damage. The top of this plant tried to turn green, but as it started to warm up, it ran out of energy and kind of figured out that it wasn't healthy. So this one will not recover. And that's what some of these winter kill things are going to look like. And as you pull that root out, it's going to be really rubbery. It's not going to have good turgid pressure. Or it's not going to feel woody like a really healthy plant. Would. So those are some of the ways we discover if that plant is healthy or not. More examples. Picture to the left had a little bit of crown rot last year, little damage trying to grow a green shoot out the top, but you can see that it's a fairly rubbery plant. We have all this other dead material around the edges. This is going to basically wither away and probably will not even make it through first cutting. Plant on the right again, dark chocolate down the center. This one was in pretty tough shape in the fall. Whatever the conditions were this year killed that particular plant. But again, it has enough carbohydrate to start to turn to green tissue but this plant will be dead uh, by the time we hit first cutting. It had crown rot, now it has winter kill. And you have to view those things. The nice bright white material is viewed as the fuel tank. And if you have any brown material, that limits how much energy that plant can actually store. This would be a picture representing a square foot of a fairly younger stand a few years back in Minnesota. This was a little farther along. Head broke dormancy and was doing fairly well. We're going to scroll in a little bit on these again. You can see this big crown in the middle does have some crown rot. But the fact that it has bright white material all the way around on the outside so it can still feed the top of that plant, this plant's going to live through the season. It does not have winter kill. It just has a stereotypical crown rot. Plant on the right. Again, nice bright white material, fairly woody composition in that crown, healthy plant, lots of green material, great stems coming out of there, good bud activity. The other two plants have a little bit of crown damage, but not winter kill. Again, they're going to make it through the season. As we get into assessing crowns, these are stock photos taken from a bunch of material that universities and extension people use. We have them in some of our management material as well. You're digging plant and you tear it open and there's basically no damage at all. We're going to score that plant as a zero. When we start to get a little more discoloration, and as you see this rating number two, as that crown rot starts to come down further into the stem or into the crown, then that's going to be rated as a number two. You get a little bit more significant damage, they're calling that a three. It, as we get more, we call that a four, and then a five is basically dead. It just doesn't know it yet. There's hardly any good white material around the edge of that root that's actually going to feed these stems over time. So that's basically a dead plant. 
We've went out in the field. We've dug a, a square foot multiple times. We've pulled the plants apart. We're going to write their little health score down on a sheet of paper. And if you average three, three over multiple places in the field, we would suggest that that field will make it this year. There will probably be a yield reduction. You should get a plan to replace that field so you have a fresh alfalfa stand for next year to replace it. Whether you spring seed a field to replace it or fall seed a field to replace it, if it scores three or higher on average, it's basically got this season left and then it's done. So that's a little bit about the rating scores, what some of those pieces look like, and we're going to revisit it one more time. Off to the left, that plant has some crown rot, pre-existing damage, going to be okay this year. It has good bud activity and growing. It can feed itself. The rest of the plants in that picture are nice and healthy. The right, green shoots started, but that plant is basically dead. That yellow color is uh, winter kill and we're not going to gain any yield from that situation. I brought that picture of those examples multiple times because if there's nothing else that you need to pull out from that is that goofy yellow soft rubbery root is basically done. You have a nice white firm root crown that doesn't have so much crown rot that it can still feed itself, you're gonna get some yield out of that plant. In the past, we have actually used some satellite technology to help us scout some of these fields as they broke dormancy. This is a 135 acre field from actually Eastern South Dakota a number of years ago. And out of 135 acres, we went and ground truth to these colors. So the first three color spectrums that had green in it, those actually looked like plants that were gonna live and make it. By using this program and this scale, it told us that you know about 30 acres out of 135 was gonna make it and be productive. We could kind of tell from the road that it didn't look good, but we ground truth to some spots, we were able to basically scout that whole township, that area where that was affected by using satellite imagery and decide what we needed to keep and what needed rotated out. You can use some of those tools as well. Kind of cuts down on a little bit of driving around and digging too much. Now, let's say that you've went, you've done your assessment and you said, you know what, that stand's gonna make it. Let's leave it. Now we are going to go count how many stems are out there. And simply because, guys, we don't harvest crowns, the root stays in the ground, but we harvest the top growth. So we need to go count the stems. If you had your little stand ring that you saw in that picture earlier, and you go out and you, you need to have roughly 45 to 50, 55 on that ring with the scale that says 55 stems or more is going to be a very good stand without yield reduction or a non-yield limiting situation. Some of you are going to get by well with 45. As we go farther west, some of you are going to be accepting of 40. It just all depends on where you're at in your whole scheme of things. But 45 or 50 is kind of the magic number. On that ring, it also has a scale that talks about the number of plants per square foot. After it's an established stand, use this as an example. Let's just say we have, on the scale, it says five plants is a good stand. But for some reason, our five plants have three stems each, like this one off to the left. That only gives, even my Iowa math, when I went to high school, tells me that's only 15. That's not a successful stand. In the middle, if you had five stems with, or five crowns with seven stems a piece, that's gonna get you in that 35 range. That's still really not acceptable. If you had a stand that averaged on 14, obviously, uh, we're gonna get over that threshold of 50. You have seen pictures already of crowns that probably had 25 or 30 stems just on one plant out of one crown. So we're gonna need to go assess that stand, see how many crowns are healthy, and then go count stems to see that we're gonna have, and basically that number comes about, how many stems do we need to have active per square foot to effectively capture the sunlight that's available? So that's where we, uh, we maximize our sunlight capture to make energy to grow those stems. This chart does show an example of you know, medium productive soils where you're gonna kind of plateau out. The curve for yield kind of changes at 50 stems per square foot. The more stems per square foot, the higher yield on the better soils you're gonna get, that's obvious, but 
it declines quicker once we hit about 50 stems per square foot. So that's a, a number that we kind of use as a gauge uh, from under Sander done research in 2011. Now, what do we do? So we're either gonna keep the stand and it's gonna stay a fresh, clean alfalfa stand or we're gonna rotate it out and we're gonna put corn in there to maximize those nitrogen credits, right? What if we still want to utilize that alfalfa stand and limp it along through the fall? What are some things that we have options that we can do? Can we put something in there that will increase the tonnage of that field, kind of help fill in a little bit for alfalfa? We had a gentleman in Wisconsin, took his air seeder, put a Brachitic Dorf BMR sorghum sedan grass in there, and went and kind of drove around and filled some thin spots maybe some waterways that were thin. And then in the back of this picture, you can see that he went and finished the field and basically uh, interceded sorghum sedan grass into his alfalfa right after they took the haylage off the first crop. So you can either make a decision today to plow it up, put corn in, or you can limp along, take the first cutting off, intercede maybe some sorghum sedan grass in there. People have asked about pearl millets. I do not believe that the pearl millet has enough edge, if you will, for competition. If the alfalfa gets too thick, it can outcompete pearl millet a little bit easier. I do believe that these uh, good drought tolerant sorghum sedan grass like the one listed here would be an excellent option to do that if you need to thicken things up. That was seeded with a drill, air, air drill. Yes, that needs to be in the ground an inch deep or roughly an inch deep to get good seed to soil contact, develop a good root system. So no-till drills, air seeders work well. We're not going to broadcast and make a successful crop out of that scenario. So, yep, thanks, Randy. Yep. I appreciate yep. you taking that yep. opportunity. Thanks. So that's an opportunity to fill in. I have also had gentlemen that have taken first cutting alfalfa off, let a root regrowth come, terminated that crop and then no-tilled and or air seeded with a drill style material uh, mechanism and put pearl millet in. Again, we are following our legume crop with a grass style crop to take advantage of some of these nitrogen credits, just like we would on a corn crop. So we can basically feed that plant primarily with some residual nitrogen off of that alfalfa stand. But again, we put pearl millet in as a solid stand and we're able to take two cuttings off of pearl millet after a June, June 1st, June 10th seeding time frame. Very high quality, very high digestibility, very good crude protein type crop. The previous picture, this shows a crop of BMR pearl millet. We also have available for guys that that maybe don't need quite the quality if you're in a different scenario. There are conventional pearl millets out there as well Then 4507 is a great pearl millet again. And you can see the leaf material that we get in these pearl millets. A little bit finer stem than a sorghum sedan grass, very, very leafy, very, very prolific tailoring, high quality product. I do have, if anybody wants to do a screenshot yourself or I can send this to anybody that needs information later, but we do have some forage quality on both of those photos that I just showed you from Pearl Millets. I can provide some data on BMR sorghum sedan grasses as well. That kind of sums up a little bit of what I wanted to show you all today about assessing the alfalfa stand. If we do have a weak stand, what can we do to address that today to continue to raise forage through these hot dry months of the year. If you do get some of these other warm season annuals planted in an alfalfa stand or you've terminated alfalfa and you want to make haylage or baleage out of these other crops and you're using triple mowers or something of the like to try to put them down, a pearl millet crop needs to be cut somewhere between five and six inch cut height. The growing point does start to migrate up in that stem and if we cut it too short we will end up with basically a second cutting stand failure. Um, so cutting height is very important and just wheel traffic in general. These are annual plants. We drive on them, we break them off, we get them cut too short. We can have regrowth issues and that's generally if somebody has a complaint We've got too many wheel tracks, we've done it on a wet day, we've cut it too short, and we reduce our second cut yields to the point where you, you kind of look at it and go, man, 
I wish that were better. Keep a few of those things in mind. If you are using some of that mer those mergers, merging at an angle. So you might either want to cut at an angle and merge straight or cut straight and merge at a little bit of an angle so it feeds into that merger better. Obviously, you're not going to do it perpendicular, but if you go at a little bit of an angle, you can get that to feed versus long material trying to go straight in. So just a, a little bit of a tip or a trick that I've had some guys tell me works quite a little bit better. It enhances the experience. If you're going to go with a sorghum sedan, are there any restrictions on cut height for that pearl millet? As we talked about the actual crop that was used, in this example, it was a brachytic dwarf, has shorter internode spaces. I would tell you that you generally get by with about a three, roughly about a three inch cut height on a brachytic dwarf BMR. Because those bottom two nodes are stacked so close to the soil surface, the general recommendation is to leave two nodes. If you, for some reason, are a guy that gets some, let me use this term loosely, but the cheap stuff, and you have a conventional or a BMR that's not brachytic or not brachytic dwarf, those bottom inner nodes could be four, five, six inches apart. You either take a chance and you cut it a little shorter than you'd like, or you need to get your header, your cutter height above the second node to enhance your regrowth experience. So that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. The answer is two nodes above the ground gives you the best regrowth. I did a study at my place a couple years ago where I actually took 27 varieties. I cut everything off at about eight inches and then I went back with the a 60 inch my lawnmower technically I cut everything at two inches I moved over I cut them at four inches I moved over I cut them at six inches technically things didn't get any better or worse once I got to a four inch cut height two inches was a little bit too short four inches was just right I didn't see any real increase or benefit to go to six or or any higher specifically on the sorghum sedan grasses again the pearl millet five to six inches is probably the best recommendation. Any less than that, guys seem to have a little less enthusiasm when they have a, re a return phone call. Let's just put it that way, right? Anybody on here still have alfalfa seed that needs to go in the ground? Don't feel like you're too late. Oftentimes people get in a really big rush and in a big hurry to get alfalfa planted before they do anything else. A lot of us have had this discussion that uh, traditionally we uh, planted you know, alfalfa with a cover crop or a companion crop of a small grain, cereal grain that love to be planted in cooler, wetter weather. Alfalfa doesn't germinate, guys, until we get to 37 degrees soil temperature. 40 degrees, it's, you know, obviously a little bit better. It's just like any other crop. The warmer it gets, the better vigor that plant's going to have, the more even the germination is going to be, the faster it's going to come out of the ground, the less it's going to sit there and lose energy and be more susceptible to soil diseases. I've asked many, many people this question. We've had lots of discussions around planting timing. We still have time to get alfalfa seed planted. I would say if you run out towards the last week of May and, and get to June 1st, then we're starting to run into issues because we could get too hot, too dry, too fast. Not saying that it can't happen regardless, but we still have time to plant alfalfa. One gentleman I asked, I said, do you like to plant alfalfa in April or May? The comment was this, Jeff, I can plant it April 15th or May 15th, and it generally looks about the same on July 15th. Warmer soils, warmer weather, faster growth, better germination, probably less disease problem. We don't have to be in a hurry. Ladies and gentlemen, if you, if you still have some seeding to go, Please be aware of a few of these pieces. Variety choices can make a difference on how well our stands established. We have better disease tolerant varieties today in many cases. Residual herbicide. I mean, we could probably talk about this till we're blue in the face and, and almost get mad, but we have an increase. Some of us on the call have probably known nothing but Roundup Ready. Others of us on the call remember a lot of residual herbicide. Then we had two decades of glyphosate tolerance. Now we're back to more residual herbicides to control some of these tough weeds. You might be in season, middle of the summer, trying to do something in a soybean crop. 
You need to be aware of what you applied, when you applied it, what the weather conditions are like. We have a document with basically would equate to two pages of herbicides that could be used today that can damage your alfalfa stand. And to the point where it might not kill it, but it has severely damaged the root system and the plant health and its yield potential. And you might have a live stand, but it's only going to be so productive keep those residual herbicides in mind. If you think there's a question, please look back in the records. It's not worth taking a chance. We don't like to do replants for recreational farming. Those are some pieces. Um, seed to soil contact is always a big topic for us. Make sure we get a firm seed bed before the seed goes in the ground. I know I had a call again the other day where a guy says, hey, we planted our alfalfa. We didn't get, the, we didn't get it packed and it rained. So can we still go back out there? And my first question was, why didn't you firm up that alfalfa stand or that field before you seeded the alfalfa? Ladies and gentlemen, even if you're going to go out there with a no-till, uh, so let's say you did some field tillage and you have an air seeder or a drill. My first recommendation is to do a, a packing method, whether it's a flat roller, corrugated roller. I have a cultipacker myself. I love that piece of equipment. I will even go across the field twice. If I pack it once and go across there and I still sink in deeper than the sole of my shoe, I'm gonna go do another firming pass to get that seed bed firmed up. Even though I'm gonna hit it with a drill and put it in the ground with closing wheels, think about how much nicer those drill units are gonna go across the ground if it's firm and fairly flat and level versus dirt clouds bouncing them all over the place. That gives us, goes to the next point, seed depth consistency. Now we can consistently get that alfalfa seed at a grid depth, we get the seed covered, we're not too deep, we're not too shallow from everything bouncing around and, and trying to get things done in a hurry. So seed to soil contact, firm seed bed ahead of time really to me does a great, great job. Even if you're in an area where they're going to use the airflow and do a surface application where they blow the seed on top, pack the field first. Then if you have to do your airflow, get a little mixing action packet again. Otherwise, I can almost guarantee you I can write the script of what that field's going to look like if we don't pack first. Jeff, I believe it was back there on uh, slide 10. You had those plants that in the center section. Most of the people that have called me with stand issues or they question plant health I don't want to generalize too much or send everybody into a panic, but go check those fields. They would have been harvested later in the fall. Has called me so far with concerns, took that late September, October cutting. And those are the ones we're seeing the most damage today. And hopefully this, this conversation stimulates more people to go check and please give us some feedback so we understand really, really what we're looking for. A couple of you on the phone today have called and asked and had some concerns. So that was the comments we had too, is that some of these later cut plants are the ones having the most damage. I had a question earlier yesterday or Wednesday too about fall armyworm. If you had stands last year that were fall seeded and we had fall armyworms come through and started clipping things off, I'd be checking those quite well because if those plants weren't perennial plants yet or they hadn't had enough growth on them to become perennials and army worms clipped them off, they would have basically killed those plants. So those would be fields I would scout pretty extensively. And if they, if you're planning to have regrowth and they came through and clipped everything off and basically simulated a cutting, if you're one of those people, Again, I just shared that some of the late cut stuff is showing some problems. So if you had one of those issues where army worms came through late and clipped it off, it'd be no different than a, than a swather going through and harvesting it as well. So check those fields, be diligent, get out of the truck, take your shovel along. And Jeff, did you want to mention weevil just quickly, how, how bad the weevil are? Yeah, so the weevils, guys. Weevils this year at, at my house, I've sprayed weevils twice. And I'm down by Kansas City, Missouri right now. It's just a matter of when and how bad. Some of you are going to have, this is a generalization, but I think it's very true. Where you had a lot of stubble out there or left that regrowth and you've had weevils in the past, the weevils lay their eggs in those hollow stems of old dead plants or in, in alfalfa stems. So generally, the fields that were cut a little bit shorter later 
we've kind of removed some more of that material. So the, the severity of weevil seems to be a little bit less because we've taken some of that, that stem material and maybe some eggs and put them in a pile somewhere. Generally, Interstate 90 and south, we have to make an application prior to first cut. Now this is generalization, understand that. At my place in Kansas City, Missouri, I've sprayed twice already. They're pretty bad. Coming north, it will happen. At about 275 degree, growing degree units, you will have the first flush. Those are the eggs that were laid in the fall. At about that same point, the adults will emerge and they're gonna start laying eggs again. The second flush of eggs will come about 400 growing degree units, somewhere between 400 to 500 GDUs. So at times it feels like we have this extended window of weevil pressure that takes us all the way through that second crop or second cutting, and that's why. So please be diligent, scout fields, look for feeding, um, take your sweep net, go scout. It's so hard for me to give you the right example. I think the rule is once you see 30% of the, the stems do have some feeding on it, that's basically a threshold to do take some action. And, and last year, if you guys remember, sometimes we have really short memories. Last year, you could go scout a field on Thursday and think things were okay, Randy. And by Monday morning, you'd drive back by that field and it would be toast. We have the potential to blow up as we have cool temperatures and then all of a sudden a nice hot fast rapid warm up they could blow up quite quickly so be diligent to scout those fields it can happen and it probably will happen to some degree so i think you can see the feeding damage on the screen now correct yep we got it this, this was at my place and i took this picture yesterday morning in uh the untreated check i left a little strip so i could tell and uh, I'm in a second story window where my office is at right now, looking over the field and I can see every spot that I missed with my sprayer is starting to turn gray. So it's very visible damage folks. And, and they don't eat stems, they eat the good stuff. So here's all your crude protein, your forage quality. Let's protect that and take care of those weeds. So anyway, a little bit about what they look like quick. And uh, aside from that, I'm gonna tell everybody that you, uh, have a good day today. Thanks for joining me over your lunch hour. I appreciate it.